Welcome to NCIX Tech Tips. I have been promising this for a long time and it's finally happened. The Prodigy is available in a variety of colors now, making it an ITX case that is compatible with liquid cooling that is one of the most customizable chassis out there in spite of its tiny, tiny size. So I'm going to do a brief rundown of all the parts we're going to be using for this ultimate performance ITX build. We have an ASUS P8Z77i Deluxe Y-Die compatible motherboard. We have a Core i7-3770K. We are using a GTX 670 due to its tiny form factor, although larger cards would fit. We have a SwiftTech Apogee HD, SwiftTech MC Res Micro, SwiftTech MCP655. Those are our CPU block, reservoir, and pump. We are using two double thick radiators. So we're using a 2 by 120 millimeter for the front and a 1 by 120 millimeter for the back. And last but not least, a Seasonic. 550 watt, 80 plus gold power supply. The tubing we're using is PrimoFlex tubing and we are ready to get started. Now guys, this isn't going to be quite to the level of detail as our ultimate water cooling guide where we show, you know, screwing in every fitting. It's gonna be more of an overall guide for how to liquid cool your very own BitPhoenix Prodigy. The first step with any liquid cooling endeavor is to figure out the configuration you want. Now I've done a fair bit of this off camera already, but you got to strip down the case. So in this case, we're removing that left side panel with the SSD mounts, which we're going to need because we're going to pull out all the hard drive cages to mount radiators as well as your IO. So we're going to pull that off. We are also going to remove the hard drive cages. So as the, uh, as the Russian joked with me, you remove this, the cages so that you have uh, more, more speed, so you have a lighter overall vehicle. We're going to remove the front bezel because that's what's going to give us access to the mounting holes that are in the front. And we're not going to be able to mount a five and a quarter inch drive anymore because we're filling up the entire front of the case with a two by 120 millimeter radiator. The bottom cage is going to have all six of these screws removed and we're going to pull that out as well as removing the five and a quarter inch cage which has screws accessible from the front here and screws accessible from the side. Yeah, the side. Now we've removed the drive bays. The only thing left now is to remove the stock fan that comes with the Prodigy. So this is a 120 millimeter Bit Phoenix Spectre. We're gonna be replacing it with a different fan. And now you can see that we've removed everything. We have a lot of different mounting hole options. So you can go with a 230 millimeter fan. You can go with a 200 millimeter fan. You can do dual 120s, which is here, 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 and here. And that is exactly what we'll be doing. The other thing we still need to do here is remove the mounting bracket for the power supply. Now power supply mounting in this case can be a bit of a challenge. So we're going to see if our modular power supply fits, but I recommend for the BitPhoenix Prodigy that you actually use a non-modular power supply. Well folks, I apologize for what the set looks like, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it during these build guides. So we're going to be configuring our fans intaking air through the front of the case and we're going to use the Spectre fans that were included with the chassis for our front intake. Now it's important when you're water cooling to pick fans that provide ample static pressure. That is actually a more important spec than CFM when you're choosing radiator fans. So the first thing we do is we take the included screws with the fans and sort of suspend, or rather the included screws with the radiator and suspend the fans in the position where we want them. So once the fans are all positioned, it's a careful job lining up the screws with the radiator itself and then using either a screwdriver or in this case an Allen key uh, because that is what's included for screws with this particular rad. We then attach all eight of the screws so they go through the fans and into the radiator keeping the entire assembly secure. You can also see that I have already installed fittings on the radiator itself. This is easier than installing the fittings after the radiator is in the case. Now that we have our two radiators mounted, it's time to start working on some of the other components, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the radiator choice. So thick radiators were used so that we could jam as much cooling as possible in here. We could 
do push-pull on this radiator if we wanted, but I'm opting not to do that because I haven't noticed much of a performance advantage when you are using high-quality fans. And I opted to do a front-mounted radiator instead of a top-mounted radiator because that prevents any clearance issues from this 120 mil rad from affecting the ability to mount a dual 120 in the top. So this gives us an effective triple 120 millimeters of radiator cooling potential inside this ITX chassis. Now we're not going to be covering how to install a CPU again, but there are a couple of notable things about this water block. Number one is that the inlet is specific. This is the Apogee HD, so you can't put flow through the block the wrong way. Well, you can, but it won't perform nearly as well. And the other is actually not that noticeable, but it's that it has an exceptional mounting mechanism, but we're pretty used to seeing this from Swiftex. So on our LG1155 CPU, we are tightening in a cross pattern to ensure that we're not putting unnecessary pressure on the processor. You guys have probably installed a motherboard before, so I'm not going to show you too much about that, but there is one trick with this particular ASUS board, and that is that it comes with long screws that need to be used on the uh, top two, here we are, so the top two uh, mounting holes, so this one and this one. Now this is the stage where things start to get a little bit tricky. I've opted to put the reservoir here because the reservoir must always be above the inlet of the pump for ease of use. So it doesn't actually always have to be above the inlet of the pump, but it is much easier to film and there's much less to film, to fill. And it is much less risk of damaging your pump because it can always be full of new fluid and it won't actually run dry. If it runs dry, it can die. So we've gone with the reservoir right here next to the rad so that it can run down to the pump, which will be mounted in the bottom using this double-sided foam tab. However, before I start filling in all the components, it's time to start running some of the tubing. So you always want to be careful when you're routing your tubing of the order of the loop. First of all, your reservoir goes to the pump. After that, it doesn't matter. But once you start putting in more components, it can get a little bit tight in there. So you want to hook up anything that you're going to do or that you can do as you go. One tricky thing that I should probably mention is my old trick with the boiling water and the needle nose pliers. So you dip the tubing into the water and then stretch it with the pliers in order to get 3 8 tubing, which is what we're using, over half inch fittings, like on the MCP655 and the stock fittings on the Apogee HD, which I wanted to use because they're black and schmexy and all that good stuff. Now, speaking of things that we're not using the stock fittings on, the video card. So the only trick with compressions is that I usually recommend installing them without the covers on. So you just screw them in like that. Hand tight, most people say, but I like to give them one last sort of, uh, one last sort of crank with a rag wrapped around the fitting and a pair of pliers. Okay, so you just go in nice and tight with those, pretty much as tight as you can. Then, whenever you're installing your tubing, you want to pre-measure the length that you're running. So in this case, we're going to go from the CPU block over to the GPU. So we're going to go from here to approximately here. You pre-cut that, and then you want to load, see, the hold downs onto the tubing before you put it over the barbs, because otherwise there's no way to actually put it on once you're done. So we'll put that over a barb, worm drive it tight, then put this over top, and we're going to be in for a bit of a treat installing that into the back of the video card here. At this stage, most of the tricky water cooling tubes are installed. So you can see that all the, the sort of mess in here that's going to be very difficult once the system is fully built is done. Now, because this board is extremely well designed, most of the connectors you actually have to plug into it are along the edge here. So there's our 8-pin, there's our 24-pin, and the SATA cables go da, 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 right about here. And finally, front I.O. goes here. And front audio goes, I'm just going to flip this right over, right there. So we can access everything, but that's no reason to make things more difficult for ourselves. So some of the tubings that we are going to put in are just going to kind of go from here to here, then finally from here to the reservoir, but they'd be in our way. So we're going to do all the other stuff first. So we're going to put in our SSD drive, which in the Prodigy is as simple as putting it here. There we go. Then using the bottom mounting holes, through the back of the case to bolt it to this piece of metal. 
Now I mentioned before we started that I thought it was possible our power supply wouldn't fit. It just barely, barely does. So make sure that you don't have a power supply that has even sort of a long modular connector on the cables. So we have to kind of thread the cables through, then jam the power supply in using the included mounting plate. And that is the only way that we are actually able to mount a power supply into the case. One tip I didn't mention before is I highly recommend removing the front removable, top rather, top removable grill. This gives you easier access to some of the things that we're going to do later. Now, okay, we got our power supply in and we're using this space right here to the side of the power supply for our cable management. So the front fans are going to be plugged in using a Molex to, or a couple of Molex to three pin adapters. We'll just run those right under the pump there so that they're mostly out of the way. So one key with the power supply is making sure that you have all of the modular cables that you're going to need plugged in because as you can plainly see, if I flip it over, there is absolutely no space to access the modular interface once it is installed in the case. This is the point in the build where you start to look at sort of no matter what order you do things in, it's going to be a little bit tricky. So rather than connecting the rest of the tube tubes now, I am going to be mounting the side panel which has all of the I.O. on it now. So we're closing up our pump which is now mounted on its foam mounting block, our wire management over here next to the power supply, and everything except this is already connected on this side. But we can reach that through the top which I showed you before. So we're going to go ahead, close up this side panel, making this one of the most compact little systems that is on the block and flip over to the other side where now we can access all of those wires and get them plugged into the motherboard before we run the rest of the tubes and those start to get in our way. For those of you who haven't watched the Ultimate Water Cooling Guides, I guess there's at least one more little tidbit I can share. So that is how I usually measure the lengths of tubing. So I just take a longer one and kind of run it sort of approximately there, then make a cut. A lot of people recommend you use tubing cutters, but I find especially using high quality compressions like this, scissors are fine because if the ends are a tiny, tiny bit rough, it's not really the end of the world. One other positioning trick that I probably should have mentioned before when I had said that the only thing that matters is having the reservoir before and above the pump. Note, there's one other thing that's actually pretty important to make it easier to bleed the system of air. So that is to get all the air bubbles out. Air bubbles affect the performance of your water cooling components and the noise that they make. So uh, the way that I've positioned the, or the way that I've put the radiators in the loop, this one has both the inlet and the outlet at the top. That makes it easier for the bubbles to get out and move to the reservoir where they will be collected and you can fill up with more water. This one on the other side here, this guy right here, I have used the top as the outlet and the bottom as the inlet, again, so the air bubbles can more easily be passed through to the next component. So now that we've installed this last compression fitting here, we are pretty much done with the actual installation. All that's left is to fill it up and turn it on. Proper water cooling protocol would have us test that the components inside and any of the fittings don't leak for at least 24 hours before actually plugging in things like the video card, the motherboard, and whatever else. This can actually be done fairly easily with a jumpered power supply separately. However, I've tested these components already and I'm fairly confident in my building ability. Also, we're using distilled water from a convenient NCIX canister. So the first thing you do is fill up the reservoir all the way. This is another reason why I mounted the reservoir here because just in case eh, anything bad happens and some water spills, it's gonna go down in the corner of the case right there where it totally doesn't matter. Come on bubbles, there you go, you can do it. So this will, because of the way we've positioned the reservoir in relation to the pump, this will flood the pump and make it so the pump doesn't just automatically die. And just in case it doesn't, we're just gonna give it a little little bit of encouragement to work some of those bubbles out of the tubing. Now it's time to talk temperatures. So the idle temperatures are all right, sort of in the uh, 30s. These I'm actually not quite sure whether to trust or not because as soon as we load it up, boom, 
we're only about 55 to 65 degrees on the CPU, which is overclocked to four gigahertz. And I made a bit of a mistake at the beginning of this video where I said we were using a 3770K. This is actually a 3570K. So that is an overclocked temperature to be very clear. Now we're gonna load up combustor. Here we go. And see what we get on the GPU in terms of temps. So to be, to be sort of illustrative of the point I'm trying to make here, it would be normal for a GTX 670 to run at anywhere from 85 to 95 degrees under load, especially in an ITX enclosure. This one is running at 44 degrees. Yay. Thank you for checking out this episode of MCIX Tech Tips, and don't forget to subscribe. And hopefully you guys build your own sweet little liquid-cooled prodigy like this.